Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Quichio, and today I'm here with Brian Fabian Crane, Frederike Ernst, and Sunny Agarwal. Today we're we're doing our you know yearly tradition of uh, having a you know, Epicenter host extravaganza episode where we just get to talk amongst ourselves, talk about uh, what happened in the last year and where we think things are going, and usually uh, uh, break apart our predictions from the previous year. Uh, before we do that, though, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors today. With Paraswap, you can beat the market price every single block. It's fast and it's highly liquid, and they just launched V5, which has a new contract and new APIs. It has a more modular infrastructure, which is more gas-friendly, and now supports free approvals using Ethereum's permit messages. They also recently launched support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC, and you can always use Paraswap with your Ledger device right in Ledger Live. So go to paraswap.io to get started. If you have crypto assets sitting idly in your wallet, well, you need to do something about that. And you should start earning rewards and contributing to network security by staking with Chorus One. They're a staking provider securing $5 billion in assets for over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. And if you're interested in running your own branded nodes, well, Chorus One has a highly available and robust infrastructure, which allows you to run your own white label node enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. So head over to chorus.one to start your staking journey today. Guys, thanks uh, for being here today and uh, taking part in this yearly tradition of, uh, yeah, talking about what happened this year and what's happening next year. So welcome everyone. This is the best part of Epicenter. I just grind through the rest of it just to get to these yearly episodes. <laughs> yeah, and like every year we say we're going to do this more often, but we never end up doing it more often somehow. Yeah, you have you have to take what Sunny says today with a grain of salt because for him it's really early. He's uh he's over uh in Puerto Rico and uh it's noonish for the rest of us and Sunny got up especially. Yeah, really appreciate it, uh Sunny. So yeah, I think like there's lots of different themes that we want to talk about today and um so I think we'll start with, you know, what, what were the big themes this year and how we perceive them into and then, uh, you know, themes for the future and, and how we think things are going to evolve in the next year or two. Um, I think the thing that everybody had brought up and is probably on everyone's mind is like NFTs, um, how like NFTs absolutely blew up this year. Um, Felica, you were... Um, not surprised, but uh, somewhat... Uh... I was totally surprised. So basically, I mean, yeah, so basically the NFTs thing, it it caught me totally by surprise. So basically, I, I, I always thought that NFTs were coming, but very much not in the way that they've actually arrived. So basically, um, to me, the way that they have manifested themselves is mostly in the status as a service domain. And I thought that basically NFTs would manifest themselves in the, um, in the realm of all things financial, but non fungible, which is actually the, the majority of assets. So yeah, totally surprised. Hmm. I, do, do you think that this current form of NFTs is what's going to be like that what's used? Long term, like I don't. Know. So, so I, what, what I'm personally really interested in is like figuring out how to like uh, use NFTs in like more DeFi protocols. So I think like most of DeFi currently is like. You know, so I guess like one prediction I have, which I you know maybe it's earlier than that, but I, I think that like DeFi and NFTs are going to become more and more like combined with each other, right? Because I think that like w you know what's all of DeFi currency is really built around these fungible tokens. And like you mentioned, like, you know, most finan fan financial assets are like NFTs. If we want to like bring like homes and stuff onto a blockchain, like we need to have like those be NFTs. And if I want to have a protocol that gets a mortgage on those homes, you need to have DeFi that interact with those NFTs. Now, the thing is like, yes, I agree with you that like, you know, the current PFP NFTs, profile pick NFTs, you know, they're not exactly that. But I think like, you know, they're just like setting the groundwork and they're, they're, you can think of them as these were the easiest things to build. And so that's why they got, they're what got built first. And, you know, there's all this stuff that's building this like tooling around them and that will be usable for more things. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting, right? Cause like NFTs, I mean, they've been around for a while, but actually I think the first 
use case of NFTs that like, I remember clearly is like Centrifuge, right? And they've been working on this for like years and years. And that was actually exactly that, right? Because they have basically NFTs for like non-fungible financial assets where you, you would basically have like an NFT for some sort of loan and then they would get pooled and then you'd have uh, like a, a fungible token that is then backed by these NFTs. So like you've had, you've had that. It just hasn't taken off in the way that it did around all kinds of stuff, though. No, now it's not. It's not just profile pictures, right? It's like all kinds of like art. The, the interesting thing about the art thing is, I mean, I um, I remember very well the. So you know, there's this team that uh, now works on Ocean Protocol, but they've had a bunch of predecessors, right? So they had this thing called BigchainDB at one point, and before that, they had a thing called a scribe. And a scribe was basically uh, ba basically doing something like NFTs where they're like tracking art ownership on the Bitcoin blockchain. And I remember having a lot of discussions with them back then. This was in 2015 or 14, maybe 14. And because I was so puzzled also, like, how is this, this have value, right? Because, like, you have to, uh, the file is, like, separate. You can still copy, like, the art thing, but then you have this digital ownership. And does this really have value? And I remember having these discussions with them in, like, yeah, 2014. And then, of course, that didn't take off. But now it is... Uh, but it makes sense to me in a way, right? Because I think you have something where you... You didn't have a market before, like it was basically not possible to, to, to kind of trade a lot of these intangible pictures, images, ideas, memes, and now you can have it. And that's pretty huge, I think. I feel like, I mean, the thing that I'm most interested in with regards to NFTs, at least in the next couple of years, like I, I, I don't know how this plays out sort of like more... I, I'm 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 not sure I have fully formed ideas about the how this plays out with non financial assets like homes and loans and things like that. But the whole PFP thing and sort of the status of the service for me, I think, can serve as a as sort of a base layer for new forms of social networks where financial services and this kind of ties into like what you were saying earlier, uh, Sonny. Like fi social networks and financial products kind of like end up merging. And it's like the the financialization of status and the financialization of um, of these sort of like in, this sort of like intangible idea of status. And I can see where you know th these things start getting bootstrapped, where NFTs are actually used as collateral. So like you you kind of stake your NFT in this these your NFTs in this new in these new networks, and then from there um, like these these sort of new social networks would issue tokens that. Um, that users could use to like, you know, using DeFi and things like that. It's like, it's not fully formed, but like, this is where I, I see like at least the, the PFP aspect uh, of NFTs heading in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think there's two overlapping things here, right? So basically there's NFTs and then there's social tokens, right? And I mean, basically um, tokens that kind of grant you access to social networks. To me, that's a different use case. It's not because NFTs to me, this is... Um, a very clearly one di dimensional thing where basically you 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 have an exact price point for each nft and so on and for social tokens it, it kind of allows for a much more for a much richer dynamic right what are some examples of social tokens you're, you're talking about so for i think the first ones were the friends with benefits uh people um uh, but I, I, I think it's proliferated. So I actually, uh, I, I, I'm not particularly active because I, I, I have too little time. But uh, I know there's tons of tons of social networks out there that are gate kept by tokens. So here's here's one like option of what you know. I, I agree that I think a lot of NFTs are currently being used effectively as like social gating tokens, community tokens. And maybe maybe what's going on is that these are, it's a sort of proof of work, right? Because, you know, once you have an ERC-20 standard kind of thing, it's very easy for anyone to just go mint a token and just like release it and say, oh, this is a community token, right? But it's like, 
if, 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 if everyone starts doing that, then like, you know, maybe the, the barrier to entry is just like so small, we're just gonna get flooded with all these community tokens that are gonna lose their value. I think by making them NFTs and like having to put some artwork into it, the community creator has, it's sort of like a bit of proof of work that they have to do. They have to do this like minimum threshold of like investing, like finding an artist and like creating at least like, you know, whether it's generate like uh, auto generative or like hand drawn or something, but you have to like create like, you know, okay, I gotta go create 10,000 artworks and then you can have this like community token. Yeah, I think I think one of the things is it's important to recognize here is the importance of firsts. Um, and, you know, like on, on Ethereum, like the, the sort of first big NFT projects, like, you know, the CryptoPunks or whatever, like those are gonna have, those are gonna remain valuable like for a long time. Like, like the first crypto punk or like the first generative art or like the first like pixelated uh, art or whatever. And then like, you know, on Solana, like the equivalent of that is like DGEN Ape. So I say that's the first kind of like PFP. And then like everything else kind of like comes like goes to zero from there. I mean, like, you know, the prices are like don't don't maintain the same value. So I think like the, the kind of blue chip NFTs will will remain valuable on every platform. And then like. Once in a while, there's going to be like a first of something. Like there's going to be a first of some a new kind of art, whether it's like you know visual art or or film or or um, or audio or music, and you know th that will happen on Ethereum. It'll happen on Solana, and these kind of like new experiences will always remain sort of like the pinnacle of like what people expect NFTs to deliver the value and the floor price will probably like stay super high. And then like everything else is kind of copies it uh, kind of goes down from there. So two things I want to add. Well, so, okay, so one is, you know, about the status thing, you know, I mean, I, I actually don't think it's that surprising. I think that's actually been this like missing piece in crypto where, um, so if, if you guys know Elaine Wu, she's like, you know, I really like her blog and I think I mentioned it in the past couple of times, but I remember like she had this post from like four or five years ago where she, she says, like, hey, people often forget this, like, other uh, value. Like, you know, we talk about the, you know, the three uses of money, right? Like, uh, medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. And so there's actually this, like, very fourth, very commonly used one, which is uh, display of wealth, right? And she's like, gold is actually, you know, made for a very good, like, money because it actually served as a good display of wealth where you could turn it into jewelry and use it to show off. Right. And that was something that was missing from the digital, like what, what, what Bitcoin was. And like, you know, initially you joke like, oh, maybe what we got to do is we're all going to get like, you know, these like gold chains that ha have them like some like trusted hardware that like shows your like Bitcoin balance on, on your thing. It's, it's like clearly that's how it's happening. And I think NFTs are sort of what came in and like filled in that gap of like being the display of wealth. Digital Lambos. Yeah, the digital Lambos, right? Um Okay, so question. How about we go around? What is everyone's favorite NFT collection or NFT here? I mean, I, I, I so I, I you know, I, I, my interaction with NFT has been fairly limited. You know, there's like some things like the Centrifuge or Urbit. There's some that are actually like non-traditional use cases. I bought a few NFTs when when we were preparing the Rarible podcast, right? Because that, that, that was kind of, but otherwise, I, I have not been very active. I have actually not bought any kind of NFTs from a collection, I think. I have Uni V3. Does this count, Sunny? <laughs> uh, I, I think that was like so epic what they did where like, you know, they, they mentioned that, oh, yes, these V3 positions are NFTs. But like when they dropped it, they actually had like a cool artwork for each NFT. And I think that like surprised anyone. And I think that was like so cool. I also still I also still have a very extensive, not safe for work collection of clovers. I don't know whether you guys remember this, and I'm still waiting for this to 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 come back so I can dump my clovers bags here. You have to tell people that like you know this was like an OG NFT because all the OG NFT projects are what's like become really popular. It was an OG NFT project. I mean this this I mean it's it's like this gen it's this generative art thing where basically um all all i mean it's a black and white thing and basically um the the it's it's um the end state of a go um of of a go game right so basically it's it's 
uh, and so basically it's it's generative it's actually super cool uh, but yeah i feel like there's uh, not a lot not a lot of uh, people pushing this my favorite nfts that, that i bought i bought them like way before this was any like was a thing i mean I, they're, they're not like worth anything but i just think they're cool and um but like there are these sort of ninja turtle figures on the uh, you can't really see it here, but like on um, with a background of like the U.S. dollar, uh, they're they're not worth anything. But I just thought it was cool to get that collection, and um, and of course, uh, you know, my junk dick pics. Uh, gotta, you know, <laughs> I love those, <laughs> and I, I'm holding on to them because I'm convinced they're going to be worth something someday. <laughs> I think for me, I I think my favorite one is uh, it's it's called stacked toads, and what happens is you get these little toads. And then you like stake them, and what happens? You by staking them, you earn stack tokens, and you use the stack tokens to like take the toads and like stack them on top of each other, and you get like a tower of toads. It is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but I think it is hilarious and funny, and like, yeah. And I think what's cool is that kind of what it did was it started introducing a lot of like NFT people to like concepts from like other elsewhere in crypto like ideas like staking and things like this so i think that was actually kind of uh pretty cool well, well let's go to the let's go to our next topic which is sort of i think sunny brought it up no because we've had the nft uh explosion and at the same time we've had DeFi, I mean, in some ways it's it's exploded, right? There's been like an explosion of activity, but at the same time, like DeFi tokens that I think were like their rage at some point, uh, especially these kind of Ethereum DeFi things like, you know, Maker, Curve, Compound, Yearn, etc., etc. They have uh, not done so well. What's going on? Yeah, I mean, this is just an observation I made recently, which was like, hey, like, you know, if you, if you go to 2020 and you talk about like, what were the DeFi blue chips, right? Uh, you know, what, what we had like Maker, Sushi, Uni, Wifi, uh, SNX, Comp, like all these things. And like, I think out of all the DeFi blue chips, like none of them are in the top 50 by like market cap anymore, other than Uni. Like, you know, Sushi and SNX are like not even in the top 100. Compound is barely hanging on. Ave is like, you know, I don't know, number 70 or something. And it's like, you know, I, it's so, you know, I asked a lot of people, of, you know, I, I was asking a few people, like more investor -y friends. I'm like, hey, do you know what's going on with DeFi right now? Why, why is it like just like not, you know, just, just slipping in like valuations? And they're like, yeah, honestly, like all the in, all the interest has like not. It's kind of boring. Everyone's just more into like NFTs and gaming now. And so I wonder if that's all it is, or if there's something deeper going on where like you know, you know, we had these like forks upon forks upon forks, and I wonder if that's finally like you know starting to be felt where like everyone's like like and you know we always like joked about oh these are just valueless governance tokens right but i think you know it might be coming a little bit true now where i think a lot of people are starting to realize that like hey do these DeFi tokens really have any actual value and it seems for a lot of them they're not even use useful for governance either so but it's also happened to the one project that has had no notable folks, right? So if you look at Maker, it's also slid down. It's at like 65 or something now. Wait, wait, wait. But isn't, Matt, isn't MIM like the fork of, effectively the fork of Maker, right? Where like, I think what, I think in 2020, everyone else started getting forked and like added a, uh, added like, uh, yield farming to the forks, right? But Maker never got forked until this year. And but now I think Spell is like flipped maker and like I think um, Mim is actually in the top is number is you know in the top fifty by market cap as their like the stable coin. So I think Maker actually did get out competed or is in the process of getting out competed right now. Yeah, I mean I also I guess that's a different topic we're gonna get to, but I also you know wonder to what extent. There's a factor here that, you know, Ethereum gas costs has just gotten like so crazy expensive that actually means like the 
you know, the amount of users has really shrunk a lot, right? Where it's it's only now people have like a huge amount and then, you know, you have people going to lots of other things, whether it's, you know, Solana, Avalanche, Cosmos Chains, Polygon, I don't know. Where, and then I, I mean, that's obviously these DeFi blue chips on Ethereum have generally not been able to you know like replicate the success on ethereum elsewhere or like even even how does that work right i guess always maybe the ones who seem to be like most aggressive in trying to do this and trying to like kind of launch of in other chains but um yeah i think that's also something where like it's, it's not working in favor of these d5 blue chips so, so you're saying that there's a sort of dilution of the user base uh, relative to other chains and the DeFi activity happening on other chains? I mean, like, let's say someone now, right? Someone new is like, hey, I want to start using like crypto and, and like, you're not even going to tell them. I mean, I wouldn't even say to them like, hey, you know, do some Ethereum thing, right? Because it's like, doesn't make sense, right? Like the, the, the gas costs are like way too high, right? Yeah, yeah so they're, they're going to go to BSC or something. I mean, most people, I think... BSC, Solana, Avalanche, you know, somewhere, right? Yeah, and that's obviously bad for the Ethereum DeFi project. Yeah, also, I feel like... I feel like the, the, the DeFi protocols that have, um, you know, tried to... Like Aave is a good example of like having, you know, tried to deploy on multiple chains. You know, there are tools to, like, move your liquidity over, but they haven't made it, like, super simple to, for, for their users to, like, you know, move their positions onto other chains where, you know, like, fees might be lower. And and I find that kind of frustrating. As a user of uh, of these protocols, like, being able to just, like, in one click move move your liquidity over, I find like, that user experience aspect is, like, not there yet. I, I, I do think that, um you know, so, one, I think that the multi-chain approach of Aave and Sushi is, like, wrong, right? Because I think that, like the interchain application specific approach is the right one, but we can get into that later. But I think like with the Aave itself specifically, so I wonder what one thing I need to like understand a little bit better is like how well are these things competing on these other platforms, right? Because I like, for example, I think that um, like I, I don't know how I, I don't know how Aave is competing, but I know how Sushi is getting pretty out competed on the other platforms, right? So if you go on Polygon, like so, Sushi has redeployed themselves everywhere, but like you know, on Polygon, QuickSwap is the biggest is the biggest DEX. On Avalanche, it's like Trader Joe, and like like so. I so I think what's happening is like you know these protocols that started on Ethereum and then try to expand are not able to compete with the protocols that are, you know, maybe native to these other ecosystems. Why do you think that is, Sunny? Um, I think part of it is just like community sentiment, like, or like, you know, the core team would rather promote the things that are like native to their ecosystem because they have a higher sense of loyalty and um, things like that. So I think that's a large part of it. And I think also the things that are native to it maybe started there first, right? Like, QuickSwap was on Polygon first, and then, uh, like, Sushi came over and stuff, right? But it's, like, by that time... Because because if, if you're expanding, you're sort of, like, playing this, like, you know, mercenary of, like, okay, all right, fine, you know, the usage on your platform is good enough that I'm going to... It's worth it for me to start, like, uh, deploying there but by that time like so the, the the missionaries who really liked that platform and had started building stuff earlier they, they've already built up a user base yeah i mean i think also one one thing is if you have like an existing token right that's already distributed to uh, you know like it constrains you a lot right versus okay you can start from scratch and induce like the entire token supply you know, tailor made to like try to incentivize and bootstrap the project on that chain. And then I think the other thing is also if you then have like some coordination, it's just it, it, it increases complexity in some ways. So I think it will also tend to slow down these projects a little bit, make them a little bit less agile and nimble and maybe, maybe customized for the particulars of that chain. Sonny, do you think we'll see, um, you know, Ethereum DeFi 
uh, applications uh, poured over to Cosmos when uh, when kind of Evmos is live and. Well, I, I think I think we'll see Ethereum applications poured over to Cosmos. I'm not sure if it'll be via Evmos uh, because I don't think Evmos solves the problem. It just you know Evmos is just another polygon or, or something, right? It's like you know maybe a more IBC compatible polygon, but at the end of the day, it's still just an app. You know, it's an EVM running on Tendermint. I think what might happen is we might start seeing. So Evmos is built on a software called Ethermint, which is you know built a lot of it was built by the Evmos team, but also by a lot of other teams as well, like crypto.com and stuff. Um, and so I think we're going to see more Ethereum applications deploy their own like sovereign chains with an EVM, right? So they're just going to take, put an EVM module and just have their contracts on it. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, like I said, I had a bet two years ago that within three years, Maker will be on its own chain. So I only have a year left in my bet. And I'm, you know, now I, I am getting a little bit more worried about the, I bet I was like pretty confident or I, I, well, you know, I made the bet cause we thought it was a 50, 50 over under. Um, but like, it looks, it's looking like that might not happen, but you know, I think like things like compound, like, you know, they have for a long time, you know, they, they haven't been playing that like multi-chain game of we're going to deploy everywhere because they made this bet on compound chain and saying like, Hey, we're going to go build an application specific chain, uh, to go and, and have that be the lending market for everything. Do you think these chains will be IBC compatible, or or that that's unlikely? Yeah, I, I I think they will be. I think that like so one because I think you know for for example, Compound is being built on Substrate right now. I have it on good authority that they kind of hate Substrate right now. I haven't heard anyone who has had a good time building on Substrate, but like I think that you know there is an IBC palette being built for substrate so that so those will the IBC so substrate chains will basically become IBC compatible yeah i think you know cosmos it just already has this like big network effect on application specific chains and being able to interoperate and so i think we're just going to see more and more of that yeah i mean i'm super bullish on this vision like i think that like, i think that it's kind of interesting to see um, Ethereum starting and Ethereum and like sort of, you know, EVM applications start going down this route. And like when I heard, you know, when, when, when I heard about like Gnosis kind of merging off into its own, uh, merging with, with XDAI so that it becomes its own chain, I thought, ah, oh, like it, it makes so much sense. And I mean, like it's, it's basically the Cosmos vision playing out on Ethereum only like without the bridging technology yet. Um, but I, I, I would be so happy to see. Um, you know, EVM chains. Um, well, like first of all, like Ethereum really adopting this 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 uh, sort of interchain vision and this like application specific blockchain vision, but also integrating IBC so that just everything works together. Sorry, I have to clear up. Uh, I think a small misunderstanding here. So basically, Gnosis chain um, is not going to be a an application specific chain. It's going to be a very general EVM based chain that kind of that that uh, basically um, is an Ethereum forerunner in terms of implementing EIPs and um, uh, does its very best to um, to uh, scale in such a manner as to retain reasonably cheap gas prices, which I think is currently um, so. I mean, obviously, there's pros and cons for the EVM, right? So basically, if if you were to sit down at the drawing board again, um, would would you modify the EVM? Almost certainly, but I mean, there's such a huge um, network effect around EVMs that basically the the bet behind Gnosis chain is that EVMs are going to be there and. They are, they are um, gonna stay kind of like um, uh, I mean various um, internet protocols are actually pretty bad standards but once they hit a certain level of adoption you can't get rid of them anymore you, you can't change the email standard or something it's like I mean yeah maybe it's shitty but it's there uh, and so basically yeah I mean that's kind of the bet behind Gnosis Chain that seems like a to be honest, that seems kind of like a strange bet to me, right? Because if you if you look at it today, right, you have I don't know what some tens of millions of crypto users, right, and there's so much at the beginning, and then if you say like, oh, actually the EVM is bad, but like 
I mean, I, I don't believe these network effects exist in the same way, right? That you have if like, whatever, TCP IP or, or like... Yeah, I mean, they, they kind of do, don't they? Yeah, you know, I see both sides of this a lot. Because like, you know, one... Okay, so I will... I will... I, I have this like tweet sitting in my drafts that I... Which is like, it goes something like... Cos, like the early Cosmos team, like Cosmos was right about everything except EVM skepticism. I think that like the early causal scene, like we had this entire vision of like multi-chain things and everything interconnecting. I think the one mistake we made was that we were way too EVM skeptical. And we I thought think that, that tweet's EV- been in your draft since last year because I think you mentioned the same thing on last really? year's episode. Well, okay. Well, yeah, it's been sitting there. I, I don't know. But I, I think like, you know, I, I think like, you know, I, I did not expect that like the multi-chain would play out in a, such it's just a bunch of generalized EVM chains that are talking to each other, right? I think that's, and that is kind of mostly what we have right now, right? Like Avalanche, Phantom, Polygon, all of these are just EVM chains. And I, I don't know, I, I'm still not sure that this is like the solution because I do, I still do think that like the EVM is the bottleneck on scalability, right? And like, I think Solana has showed that where like you just, if you want to achieve any sort of real scalability, you just have to throw out the EVM because that, like you, like Avalanche, you know, they, they say they they do all these like cool things at the consensus protocol layer, but at the end of the day, none of it matters because the EVM is the bottleneck. But I mean, what you could do is, I mean, you could reduce like the database or the state size by taking um, a snapshot um, every year or something. I mean, there's ways to actually combat this and make it workable, right? Or you just build like a compiler from Solidity to like LLVM and like, you know, let people write their contracts in Solidity and, you know, run it on other state machines. You know, I guess another sort of thing to talk about would be like, I think, um, right, so this is kind of maybe jumping ahead because this is one of, one, one of the things I wrote as like a prediction for the future, but I think it picks in where I, I do think that 2022 will be like the year of app chains where like, I think that Terra has like set the precedent for this, right? Terra, Terra was like the execution of the cause of the cosmos vision where what they did was they start, they started with this like application specific blockchain, uh, which is a stable coin. And then they've like sort of built like a tiny ecosystem around it where they're like okay we have this like app this application and then they're like okay we want to like drive usage for this application let's start building more sub protocols on top of it and they built up a little ecosystem on top of it and then you know i think what's going to start to happen now with terra is you're going to see applications on terra start to break off onto their own chains because you know i'm already talking to applications that are sort of in the pro you know thinking about this uh right now and i think that like people you know, and I think there's like, you know, projects like Thorchain and Osmosis and stuff have been like following in that vein. And I think we're, I think we're going to start to see more and more applications start to do that being like, hey, you know, I, why, why, why aren't we also taking this like more application specific route? And I think 2022, we're just going to see a huge explosion of these. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's another, another thing that was a big thing in, in, this year, was, I was, I think, IBC uh, launching, and then it's act. I mean, it's been development forever, and then it's pretty. I think the amazing thing has been like you know, just I don't know, it got to like one million transaction IBC transactions sent, like you know, very quickly. I don't know, less than two months or something. And then uh, the other, the thing that maybe surprised me the most. And I think, yeah, big credit to like Sunny and the Osmosis teams on that was just the user experience I thought was like shockingly good. Uh, Because I was often like worried, wondering, is that going to be okay? But I think that's actually, yeah, it's, 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 it's good. So I think that's, you know, that's clearly playing out well. And I think that's just going to grow a lot. And of course, we can have other cha- other types of rich technologies that will also have great user experience. I think the, int- the and it's interesting thing. It's interesting also, yeah, to think about bridges and sort of see these like two ways. I think is is breaking out, right? I think there's like one thing, which is uh, a bridge where you have like some trusted set of parties, and I think that maybe the two leading contenders there seem to be like. Uh, wormhole and axelar and 
that's pretty nice because they can the trusted parties can basically run like a full node on like whatever chain and they can make the footprint on the chain very easy and it can make a great user experience and you can, you can support like all kinds of chains. And then, but of course the downside is these operators have to then decide, okay, we are going to run the full node on this chain. And of course the nice thing with IBC, that's again, pretty amazing. It's just the permissionless nature, right? Like you can just spin up connected chains and, 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 and so I think that's, the, that's, I think both of those technologies have like a huge future. Uh, and then, yeah, I think both of those have come a very long way this year. Uh, maybe the trusted bridges are like a little bit behind, but not much, right? I think that it's, it's also very soon that I think they'll have, uh, you know, be basically like very usable for like uh, normal users. I want to ask you guys about like sort of IBC and wormhole bridges, like type technologies. What, what do you, what, what are the cost structures look like here and where are like, is IB, am I right to assume here that like IBC is cheaper um, for, for users than like the wormhole uh, kind of model? So what I would say here is how, what I see the difference here is IBC is much, much higher integration cost where because IBC is this like very trustless like client protocol. Uh, and then you have these trusted bridges where you basically have people run nodes. To get IBC integration, you actually have to build something into the blockchain itself. And getting that IBC protocol into more frameworks is challenging, right? So, you know, we're working, you know, the Cosmos teams are working on like, you know, getting it into Substrate. And, you know, I know Course One is working on getting it into Celo. And this, you know, it, it's, it's a work in progress. With something like Wormhole, it's very easy. You just have to ask your validators to set up, to run nodes for the counterparty blockchain. And, you know, there's still, there's still development work to be done, you know, so you still have to integrate multisigs and you have to like, you know, there's work to be done, but it's not as much. But I think the key word there is you have to ask your validators. I think that the difference will come down to some, something like Wormhole is really useful for connecting what I call trust uh, famous blockchains. It's like, you know, it's great for connecting things in the top 100 to other top 100 chains, right? Where you have to have this like, you know, you have to get people to agree to make that connection and run nodes and has these like, higher cost. The beauty of IBC is given how permissionless it is, where literally to make a connection between two chains, you just make a transaction on each chain and you have a connection going, right? And I think what hap that I think that's how you move from the world of hundreds of blockchains to thousands and tens of thousands, right? There's like chains I have never heard of that are like enabling IBC on Cosmos right now and connecting to Osmosis and like don't even have to talk to us about it, right? They're just like going ahead and doing it. And I think that's like the permissionlessness is what's going to be like very different. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also, if you think of like, okay, what would these bridges, what is sort of the topology of these bridges? So I think if you look at something like Axelar, right? Well, Axelar is a Cosmos SDK chain. And I think, yeah, I think Wormhole is going in a similar direction, right? So it's Cosmos SDK chain, and then you have basically any any Cosmos or any IBC chain can just like connect to that, right? And you don't have to ask anybody, and you can just use IBC. And then Axelar can basically have their protocol to connect to all these other chains, right? So I think it makes sense to have like you know Cosmos bridges via IBC connect to like you know the bridge chain that then connects to like all these like non IBC bridges. And so you, you kind of see both there, right? You can see the, the advantage of both, uh, both approaches. And then you can just combine them by having, yeah, basically like a chain that's run by a bunch of validators that you're connecting to all these other chains that then connects to all the others via IBC. So I think one of the other topics we wanted to touch on and, you know, we, probably uh get to the the to the the prediction soon because uh we're, you know, we're already at like 40 minutes here but it's been really interesting uh is like the pro proliferation of DAOs, uh dow toolings and um the you know emergence of new uh organizational paradigms and i think like one of the areas where 
We've seen lots of DAOs come up this year is around NFTs. So there have been like lots of NFT projects that have created DAOs um, with varying, I say like, like varying utility. <laughs> um, but what are some of the other kind of DAO projects that you guys have seen perhaps like outside of, um, outside of NFTs, so like in DeFi or like community governance? I mean, I think what we saw was like the, we, we've started taking Telegram and Discord groups and calling them DAOs, which I think is kind of funny, but like kind of not wrong either, right? Where like, you know, we, I think, um, so what, one of my, my, my friends, they, they built this project called uh, Commonwealth, which is this like governance forum for like, uh, and, but they, they pitched this idea to me called, um, token curated communities where like you launch a token and it builds a community around it and the community figures out the use case and I was all I, I was actually a little bit skeptical when they pitched it to me but it's like interesting that like what they did so so if, if anyone's familiar with like the ion token ions are this like to secondary token in osmosis that like it started as like just two days before launch where like hey let's just add in a token and airdrop it to a bunch of people and uh, don't tell them why or what it's for or why they got it or anything and let's just see what happens and like it, it grew this like really big organic community around it uh, and this like community is like doing all sorts of like you know like you know they're, they're, they're building stuff and they're like designing protocols and all this kind of cool stuff and it's like funny enough I think the most powerful DAO tool that's been created so far is Telegram. Brian, what's going on with like free ton? Because I was just thinking about it the other day. Because I'm like, man, imagine Telegram figured out a way of monetizing like all the value that's being built off of their like platform. And like, it's kind of sad that it kind of just like failed in such a spectacular way. Is there anything still going on with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So probably most people don't know the history here, but like uh, I can spend like, few minutes on it but basically right telegram was was uh wanted to launch a blockchain and they did this huge token sale this like raised like two billion or something like that and then the acc and they they had done a lot of the development work and then the acc basically like last minute was like you can't launch this thing and then telegram basically kind of like repaid their investors but the code was was kind of there and there was some other company that was also like working on this thing and so then these other were like oh let's go and launch this thing anyway and put most of the tokens in the community pool right so and then of course also we were like one of the validators that kind of like you know help launch this thing and it's still running they're actually rebranding to ever scale now though because apparently like the whole tom and thing has been like uh uh you know a bit a bit of a so it's, it's still running i think the, there is a seems to be like a pretty active community uh it's sort of you know it, it, there's not too much intersection like you don't really hear about it much because i think it's like its own community so let's see where it goes but it, it's, it's pretty active of course it's totally decoupled from telegram at this point right it's just it, it's basically just another like uh, layer one smart contract blockchain. Uh, now, of course, maybe at some point, you know, Telegram will like integrate that or maybe something else, who knows? I, I think in the end, it seems very likely to me that Telegram will probably, right, turn the Telegram app into some kind of crypto wallet. I guess it seems like probably not launch their own blockchain at this point but uh but i guess that's another thing that's starting to happen right is is that you have just the more more crypto features being added to like mainstream consumer apps and i think if you see the if you see the kind of monetization and business models and economic effects of like crypto, then I'm sure this is some also something that's going to continue in a big way. I mean, I think even just this year, we did see it added to a lot of like traditional payments apps and stuff. But like, I think we're going to see crypto and more, you know, I'm hoping that we will see more like proliferation of existing crypto. You know, I, I know there was a lot of controversy this year around like signal and how they like added mobile coin in and everyone is like ah what 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 is this thing and like 
you know, just go out of Bitcoin wallet or something like that, right? So I, want, I wonder if how that's going to play out. I, I remember there was a couple of days ago where like Discord, you know, I don't know, the CEO of Discord was like, oh, we're experimenting with some crypto stuff. And then they got this like massive backlash from like uh, their community, which is obviously a lot of gamers. And it's funny yeah, that game- I, I, So basically that was also what, what amazed me, how big the backlash from the Discord community, f f who for me, would have been people who are so familiar with in-app purchases and so on still was. Why do you think that was, Sunny? They're still mad at us for stealing all their GPUs. Like, like, I legitimately think that's like 70% of the reason. reason. Yes, oh, yes. Wow. I th okay. I think that the gaming community is still pissed about the GPUs. Ha has anyone talked to them about proof, proof of stake? Um, maybe, probably, I, I don't know, maybe... Probably not, to be honest. I mean, I don't know how well they understand it, but you know, we can tell them all we want about proof of stake. Okay, Sunny, you 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 sort that out. You go speak to the gamers and explain to them proof of stake. Sunny, it's it's your age cohort. I think it should be you. It's I mean, I I give him a call. I'm not a gamer at all. What's 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 this boomer doing here? I'm not a gamer at all, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, well, even if we did tell them, maybe they did understand proof of stake, but we told them that it would be coming in like, what, 2017? And here we are like four years later and like we're still sucking up their GPUs, right? You know, I wonder even once Ethereum switches away from proof of stake, I don't know if that's going to get solved, right? Because, you know, some other GPU coin is going to pop up and still going to be the, the suck of like GPU compute. So I'm not sure that's really going to be a solved problem. I I think basically the I mean the the demand is gonna go down though right I mean so basically I think I mean if if like large market cap uh, chains um, shy away from uh, from proof of work it's bound to happen no I don't know if we're gonna get to a world where like I I, I think that the I mean, no matter what, the opportunity cost of using GPUs for gaming versus mining is always going to lean towards the mining. And so the costs are still just going to go up for, for GPUs. I have um, a thesis that kind of brings together the last two points we talked about. So I think um, uh, a good chain for DAO tooling um, is going to make a huge, um, is going to be a huge asset in the layer one wars between uh, between different chains. So I think the chain that kind of draws um, are the communities a a around DAOs. Um, it's it's just, uh, it, it'll be difficult to beat. And, you know, one, another thing to discuss about, you know, kind of semi-related to the ESG, like, you know, kind of stuff uh, is, uh, you know, I, I, I want to talk about like the Elon stuff and like the return of Dogecoin. And, I you know, so I think for me, I think that was actually one of the biggest things that happened this year. It's like sort of this like return of meme coins, right? Where it started at the beginning of the year with the GME stuff that happened in like, you know, the normal like Wall Street bets and all that kind of stuff. And, I, you know, I wonder how much of it, which direction this like cultural thing came from. Like, was it a lot of like, you know, it felt very like this moment where like, oh, crypto culture is like, or like vibes are like, proliferating into like the normal market and I but I wonder if at the same time it was also like heavily influenced in the other direction as well um yeah I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on like you know just how how, how much like you know just the meme coinery that's been happening and like Shiba entering the top 10 by market cap and things like that yeah, I did not see that coming. So basically, I I thought you know I I, I didn't even get do. I mean, I kind of semi get Dogecoin, but basically, yeah, I I I mean Shiba, I I just don't get it. I mean, uh, yeah, I I yeah, maybe I'm I'm too much on the boomer side here. Yeah, and I mean, in the end, it's like a lot of you know, non crypto people who are getting burned by those things. Uh, I mean. Okay, so I have two interesting thoughts on Dogecoin, right? One is I when I left Tendermint uh, like l last summer uh, and I was figuring out what do I want to spend my time doing, this, so this is before I started working on Osmosis, one of the things I spent like a couple days actually like researching and looking into was, hey, I want to bring Dogecoin onto proof of stake. Because uh, I had this like whole idea of that like, you know, okay, 
we're going to show Dogecoin moving to proof of stake. And this is going to be like set the groundwork to move Bitcoin onto proof of stake in like 20, 30 years from now. Um, and so, and I, you know, and I, you know, I, I just still really like Dogecoin. Like Dogecoin was actually my first like exposure to crypto. And it was like, you know, it has like this special place in my heart, I guess. Um, but then when I looked into it last summer, you know, I spent time like researching the community and going through their Reddit and stuff. And I came out with the conclusion Oh, no one, Dogecoin is dead. Like, no one seems to care about Dogecoin. I'm just this, like, weirdo that still seems to care about it. But, like, otherwise, this is, like, a dead project. And then, like, you fast forward, like, six months, and it's like, holy shit, I was very wrong, obviously, right? And so I think that's, like, a very funny... You'd be a Doge billionaire by now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I still think there's a good chance that we can get Dogecoin to Entrepreneur State, right? I think, I think that Elon stuff actually helped. Where, like, you know, because of his whole, like, uh, energy usage stuff with Bitcoin, if we can get Dogecoin onto proof of stake uh, and get, like, a tweet from Elon, like, supporting this, I, th- I, th- I think Dogecoin will move on to proof of stake. And I think this will be, like, I, I, so here, here's the other thing, right? I actually, you know, I am very bullish Dogecoin. And I just, like, I, th- I think it's the second most important crypto. Because the thing is, I can go out on the street today and ask someone if they know what Bitcoin is, and they will, right? They've heard of Bitcoin. But I can ask them if they know what ETH, Ethereum is, and they actually probably don't know what it is. They don't, like, you know, but like, you can ask them if they've heard of Dogecoin, and they have heard what it is. And I do think that Dogecoin is legitimately the thing with the second highest, like, cultural permeance. And like, I think that is very important. I, I Okay, I think this year, the number of people involved with crypto has expanded massively. And I legitimately think it's from two things, which is one is the NFTs and the other is Dogecoin. So when hyper Dogeization? Once, well, you know, we, we, got, we got to find some people to switch it on to proof of stake. I think this, will, I think this is like a one, one year project. And, we, you know, if anyone, if anyone listening is interested in taking this on, like, please reach out to me. We will fund you to do this. Like... We have funding for this. Funding secured. <laughs> there's, there's, there's an allocation of the Osmosis uh, community pool that is, uh, yeah. that is put aside for... <laughs> yes, there's, an, there's, a, there's going to be $150 million in the Osmosis community pool by the end of the week. And we will make sure there's a solid allocation for anyone who wants to help move Dogecoin onto proof of stake. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, though, it, in a way, it's... The Dogecoin thing, like, okay, why? And I think the GameStop analogy may, like, makes perfect sense, right? Because basically it's sort of like the power of the crowd, right? Could people can be like, oh, let's just rally around this thing, all like, you know, pump it up together and it's kind of fun and it can have an impact and it can, you know, pump and make money and, and then maybe crash or who knows. And I, I think that's, yeah, that's just a very powerful thing, right? Like, I think we see again and again, like, these memes and ideas are just very, very crucial. But you need you need a common em- enemy, right? So, I mean, basically, the entire apes together strong um, thing. Uh, this only works if you rally against someone like, uh, I mean, uh, the hedge funds or, you know, the people who, who say, oh, oh, why are you poor? You're eating too much avocado toast. Just invest in stock. And then, you know, you do it and they go like, no, not that way. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's like, I mean, you, you kind of you need this um, you need this image of what you're uh, going up against. Right. So question is that is that is the CEO of Citadel the what like? Is he like a literal Bond villain? Because like, you know, he must have heard of Constitution Dow trying to buy the Constitution and this like whole community organized thing. And I, I feel like he like specifically went in and was like, no, fuck this. I'm going to like go rug this like Constitution from like this like community organized effort. Yeah, that is actually Constitution Dow. I mean, in a way, it, it makes sense though, right? Because he's like, you know. I'm a front runner, yeah, right? Yeah. And what I do is still you know, like front runs with me. It's like, well, this thing, I can front run this. Pretty obvious, right? So in a way, it's like, you know, hanging a fish in front of his mouth and then like, <laughs> he has to eat the fish. 
But actually, the Constitution DAO was like another weird thing to me, like crazy thing, because I was like, this is a cool idea. I would like support this. And I, so I put some ether into it. And I, I honestly thought of it as like, oh, this is just like, it's like a donation, right? And then, and then the thing failed. And uh, the people said, oh, we're going to shut it down. But there was a token and the token. And so I ended up, you know, like then selling this people token. And it was something like 20 times up in these terms, right? In, in within like two weeks for a project that basically seems to have failed. And that's, that's also such a <laughs> like bizarre thing. And, and the most amazing thing would be, okay, like, now what if these people actually turn it into something? Because that's, that's the weird thing, right? Like, okay, they lost the auction, but actually this, in a way, the, the whatever, 40 million that was like put into that thing was at some point then, you know, a market cap of, I don't know, was it like a billion or something? Or definitely like more than 10 times up from, uh, so yeah, bizarre. <laughs> But I think it goes to show the power of these, yeah, these memes. I, I like how in the mainstream press, um, basically the way that the constitution DAO was described was frequently um, as a group of internet friends, <laughs> which I think it's funny and it's, it's totally not wrong, but it's so funny. <laughs> That's so wholesome. So to bring it back, you know, just to bring it back to the Dogecoin thing, one more, one last time, just, uh, is this one thing I wanted to mention as well was, you know, I think like every epicenter episode, uh, every end of year episode, I've always like brought up this idea, like sort of this bet with Brian that like Litecoin is going to remain in the top 10. And I think this year is fine. I, 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 I've been winning that bet for the like last three years, but I think this year I finally lost that. But I will say it is because of the black swan of Dogecoin flipping Litecoin which I did not expect, right? Because I, 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 my whole like, thesis on Litecoin was this like mimetic of like, hey, it is number two after Bitcoin, and that is a funny meme, and that will keep it going. But once Dogecoin had flipped Litecoin, I think that like meme stops working. And I think Dogecoin has basically taken that like cultural place of that Litecoin did. E even Shiba uh, uh, flipped Litecoin now. Um, so I guess the last thing that we had on our like uh, on our like interesting things for this year was uh, Bitcoin and El Salvador. So what are your guys' thoughts on this? Is it is it is it a big deal or not? I I think it's a big deal. I think in the end, if you if you look at the crypto thing, right, like what what are the potential responses? I think one big response is going to be like. This thing is threatening, you know, our power, uh, it's threatening, you know, our control. So we are going to like, I don't know, try to ban it. I don't know, like in China or maybe restrict it in some like very, very narrow control way, which seems to be like India now, right? Or like in some other ways, try to control it. But there's obviously that obviously means with the ability to just like move somewhere else and all of this being basically open accessible anywhere anyway it, it means like actually the more some countries do that the more there is to win by other countries going the other way and and then you also have to think and that that applies you know if, if you look at crypto right if you look at bitcoin you've always had the effect that like if you know this thing is going to happen or it has a good chance of happening if you go first, you have the most to gain. And I think the same thing is true of countries, right? So I think countries that like deviate from this control crypto path and countries that go early, you know, have a huge amount to gain. And then I think the El Salvador thing of basically now, yeah, supporting Bitcoin, issuing bonds to buy Bitcoin and stuff. Like it, I think it is huge. And I think it's, it will end up being a an amazing decision for them. I think you had like an interesting thing you mentioned earlier where it's like, the micro strategy, like play applied to a country. Yeah, totally. I mean, the opportunity cost for a country like El Salvador was also a lot lower than of countries that actually have a financial market 
policy for their for their currency, right? So basically, if you're, for instance, the US, you have a lot a lot more to lose than a country that de facto uses a foreign can, uh, a foreign currency as as its as its currency anyway. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Like who's going to do that? Yeah. I mean, countries that don't have their own currency. I think it's like small countries, poor countries. Uh, it's not and it's not going to be, you know, the US and, and Germany and China and India and, you know, all these huge countries that have. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, of course, let's see. Like, I would say, like, you know, for me, it was like, I know a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, it's just like, you know, it's El Salvador. It's like a tiny country. But, I, you know, for me, when I, it took me a while to like, I was just very busy with like Osmosis Law to that time. But like, one day I was just like sit in the shower just thinking and I was like, holy shit. Like, can we like, let's rewind back five years ago. Like, at least when I got into crypto, like, I would have never like imagined like being like a real country like not like a fake country like Liberland or something right no this is like a UN recognized country just declared Bitcoin as legal tender and that like, just the like magnitude of like wow how far have we come in this like great like geopolitical game of the 21st century that like Bitcoin is like legal tender of a country from being this like internet dark money from like five years ago i think i think that's a big like big leap one small step for a coin one great leap for coin kind i don't know <laughs> yeah, I, I think this kind of ties in well with uh with one of the themes you, you know you had mentioned brian which is like government legitimacy and you know if if smaller countries that have like less opportunity uh that have like a lower opportunity cost start um uh, you know, using Bitcoin as legal tender, issuing bonds as legal tender, uh, denominating, you know, perhaps government services uh, in, in crypto. If a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these countries start using Bitcoin, uh, do, you, do you guys think that there's, you know, a potential for that to become a sort of dividing line between, you know, Western countries that try to, um, yeah, I'm talking about like US and Europe uh, you know, that, that, that try to keep like grasp on like their power of the world and of finance versus like all of these kind of other countries that, you know, Western countries will want to portray as being like anti-establishment, um, you know, anti whatever money laundering, anti money, like anti anti money laundering, like anti anti terrorism, like. Do you think that will if 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 this starts to play out and like a lot of African countries and like South South um, South American countries start adopting Bitcoin, that this um, new axis of evil, you know, we you know we might want to put it like uh, starts to emerge. I, I I let me maybe talk about. So I'm not sure at this point, but let me talk about like this, my idea of the, around this government legitimacy point, because I see it maybe a little bit differently. So if you, like how do governments have legitimacy, right? Like they make basically a bunch of rules and then they need to be able to like enforce those rules most of the time. Right. Like, of course, there's going to be like some people who like don't follow the rules. But in general, you have to be like, OK, if, if the government makes its rules, I better follow them because otherwise, like uh, they're going to come after me. And if they can if they can do that, then like, OK, you have to like respect the power of the government. But already, I mean, crypto is, is kind of a problem for that. Right. Because even if you look at now the SEC, right, the SEC. Uh, at some point made their statement of like, oh, you know, all these token sales are securities and like, you know, that kind of function that most people were maybe like intimidated enough and they didn't do it and they enforced it. They went after a bunch of projects, but they, even there they had the problem that, you know, the number of projects they could go after was like limited because their resources are limited and they have to do like this investigations where it doesn't scale at all. And, and then of course you had all kinds of stuff going on for a long time that, you know, I guess is, is against their, their sort of spirit. And now if you look at, uh, 
if you look at all of the things happening now with like DeFi and DAOs and NFTs, and I mean, where is like the SEC, right? They're like years behind somewhere else. And I, I was recently speaking with, you know, some German company that's like regulated, speak a lot of regulators. And they were telling me like, oh, they speak with regulators and like each time they're like, what's staking again? Like how? And, and they're just like totally somewhere else, right? Like years behind. And so I think that's uh, already is like a huge problem for like the regulators and the legitimacy and power of regulators. But I think where it's going to get like much, much worse is around taxes. Because taxes is not something that's just applies to like a bunch of companies and projects, but it applies to like everybody. And I think that already you have to challenge that if, if you're like active in crypto and if you make, I don't know, D NFT, DeFi stuff, a a, a, you know, yield farming, a, a bunch of transactions, it becomes like really hard to file taxes, right? Because first of all, like what are even the tax rules that apply? And second of all, even if you have some understanding of the tax rules, how are you going to go and like get all together these transactions? And I mean, it's, it's, it's like gets pretty quickly to sort of the point where it's like an impossible task. And, you know, as long as it's a small group of, you know, crypto people that do that, maybe it's not such a problem. But I think if you get to the point where you have, you know, 10% of the population or 20% of the population that are like using those things because they're like, I don't know, games and artists, and they're just part of like the consumer application people use. And then they're also, even without wanting to, basically violating the taxes and not filing it properly. And like, I think that's going to be like a huge, huge problem and like extremely hard to address. I agree. And I so basically, um, there's a couple of governments that have started addressing this by um, just taxing um, off ramps. Right. So, for instance, Austria does this now. So basically, there's um, uh, you pay capital gains tax on all your gains um, at 27 and a half percent or whatever Austria's capital gains tax is. Um, but it only applies to uh, to off ramps. And I mean, to a certain extent, that's a good rule because um, it, it or you can forget all your crypto to crypto. You just need to have like some cost base uh, that you construct somehow. But uh, basically, all the crypto to crypto transactions, they kind of you, you can forget about them. But on the other hand, um, I I would assume that we move into a direction where the um, where the line between crypto and non crypto assets will be. Uh, will be increasingly erased. And then basically, what are you going to do then? So basically, then um, you, you tax like a certain class of, of um, assets at 25%. Um, you class income differently. You class, I mean, it's, it's, it's a total mess and I don't know how to go about it. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, like France does the same thing, right? It's like you, you, you only get taxed on, on the off ramps. Um, and already there, it's complicated, right? Like even as a, even as like a crypto user, because like you have to, you have to kind of like, you know, keep track of like every time you go in and every time you go out. And it's like, is the, uh, like, it's also not clear whether or not like off ramping is just selling into euros on like Kraken or actually moving money to your bank account. Um, just kind of like, it's kind of vague there. What if you buy, what if you buy a house with USDC? That's also unclear. <laughs> so, so that's 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 also sort of unclear. Yeah. What what if you buy a token that allows you to live in a house for a year? Yeah, or like, what if you use USDC to like invest in equities or invest? Like, I mean, there's all these sort of edge cases that, uh, like, what if you take a loan against like you know a, a, a like a position on Aave and use that USDC to like invest in a company like uh, or or you know where you get shares essentially? Like, there's all these sort of edge cases that laws the, the law currently doesn't account for uh at least in france i think like a lot of places there are all these like sort of gray areas that probably will get figured out in the next couple of years but then then there's just the question of control and like i think it touches on brian's point is like you know where like how easy is it for governments to actually control these things and i think it does fall into the bigger pro into the bigger issue of legitimacy that i was talking about earlier it's just a different facet you know, it's like the legitimacy of crypto as the thing that people use to like, you know, 
you know, like buy things, invest, etc., versus uh, the legitimacy of like existing institutions. And whether that exists sort of at an individual level, where it's like people, you know, having to pay their taxes or whatever, or like a government issuing bonds and being like, fuck you to the, to the, you know, to the, to the dollar standard. Uh, it, it touches on like the same, I think, uh, legitimacy issue of like, you know, well-established economies and well-established countries, like trying to um, really hamper like the development of crypto. I'm not sure what the, what the response is. I think the taxing off-ramp things, it just, I, that's clearly not going to work, right? Because like very quickly, you're going to have stable coins and all that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't have to off-ramp ever right or like maybe only if you have like some sort of consumption but then it maybe like just equates to like VAT right or something I mean so I, I, I don't think the off-ramp thing is gonna is gonna fly I think from a from a from the perspective of like it being easy for people to like pay their taxes I think a wealth tax is actually uh, easiest to do right because like let's say if, if if at the end of the year you just have to see oh what are my crypto assets and then like self-report it and you're like oh you're paying like half a percent of that in taxes or something like that like that at least i think that is going to be pretty you know you don't have to think, worry about your transactions during the year and like i think that that w- it would of course still be hard it would not it would be hard for governments to like make sure people report it honestly but at least if people want to pay their taxes honestly i think that's something that's you know gonna like work well uh even in the future but of course that's completely different from the way taxes work but right? even where you have a wealth tax and in, in i mean switzerland you have a wealth tax you don't have capital gains tax so like that it kind of like still works pretty well i think there are uh, I'm not sure, you know, how like staking and yield farming and stuff like that is treated. So it's it's probably it's still going to be issues. But I think that tax system works like much much better than a lot of others in in this kind of environment. Yeah, and I mean Germany in principle has a wealth tax. Basically, it's just currently zero percent. So. I mean, in principle, this has been done before, right? I just basically we just got a new government, and there's uh, um, there's a uh, one of the one of the parties that have come to power is the business friendly um, Free Democrats, and yeah, so basically in Germany, there's no chance of that happening in the next four years. Do you guys want to talk about MEV? I know it's one of the things that kind of we talked about in advance. Uh, and uh, speculate about what would happen in 2022. And there were there were pretty um, disparate um, opinions here. It's a solvable problem. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. Yeah, I'm 100% with Sunny on this one. Great. On to the next point. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, yeah. So you think it's, how is it solvable? Or like, you think it's a solvable problem for like a particular application or like... Let's be more specific. I guess what I'm talking about is like, yeah, look, I, what I care about more about than MEV is front running, which is like a very specific type of MEV. Um, but, you know, I think there's this like harmful meme that's in the community right now that MEV is like an inevitable like evil that we have to like deal with and like, okay, we should just like, you know... Um, Instead of, instead of like trying to solve the problems, we should instead, you know, just build these tools to like extract them and like, you know, have this be a profit source and like all this stuff where it's like, no, this is like literally harming users. And like, you know, I think one of the, we were talking about with our team, like, okay, what is, why are DEXs better than centralized exchanges? And I think the biggest reason we could come up with was because they can provide MEV resistance in a, or like front running resistance in a way that centralized exchanges can't. I think that is, you know, that is the reason why you should use a DEX over a centralized exchange. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I, I I, I, I think that certain types of, you know, is MEV going to be eliminated to zero? No, there will always be some MEV uh, and some front running. But it's like, I just think that the community is like settling on a very harmful like spot where it's like, oh, this is actually okay. So we've been thinking quite a lot about this. Uh, 
and also thinking a bit about you know like the ethical thing but yeah like, like one so you know sandwiching right people were like okay that's clearly bad right people using and like okay that seems to be bad and but then i was like looking at this other thing so this is like liquidity sandwiching it, it was called right but basically it's like okay someone's making like a trade on like uniswap right and on uniswap v3 right you can say uh, where you provide your liquidity Right, so you can provide it in like a very, and you know, normally somebody might say, oh, I provide it in this larger range where most of the trading is. And then, uh, but if you can concentrate it very narrowly, right, it means like with little capital, you can provide a lot more liquidity. And so basically this liquidity sandwiching was like, okay, someone's seeing, oh, some trade is coming in there and they're putting in basically liquidity in this pool before the trade happens, they take it straight out, right? So basically they have like provided liquidity for like an infinitesimally small, uh, infinitesimally small moment. And now is this like good or bad, right? Well, for the trader, it's good, right? Because they're getting less slippage. Uh, for the liquidity provide, the other liquidity providers in the pool, it's bad, right? Because they get less of the fees and this other guy just comes up with like little, uh, there was some guy from Uniswap, right, who like commented on this thing and he was like, this is amazing. Like, what an amazing use of the power of Uniswap V3, right? And now if you, if you think of this... You know what that's called? That's called an, that's called an order book. Yeah, but, but I think if you think of like, okay, what are the like second... I mean, first of all, what are the second order consequence of that? Like, I don't know, maybe Uniswap V3 has to change their design, right? Maybe you could make a... Maybe it just is the reality of how it works, right? And maybe liquidity providers have to adjust, like, but it, it makes it very much of a thing of like good, bad, hard, like, how do you even know? How do you even look at it? And so I think if you look, if you, I, I kind of like Phil, Di so Phil Dian, you know, the guy who uh, did a lot of his work and, and is uh, one of the Flashball founders. He had an article where you, he was basically sort of saying, okay, if you look at MEV, there's like, if you're like a miner or validator, you should like extract it. If you're an application developer, well, you have to design your application, right? So for example, Uniswap V3 has to then think about well, it's possible for somebody to show up, provide liquidity for a single block, remove it straight again. And like, what does that mean for their design? Does their design still work or not? I'm not sure, right? But maybe they have to change it. And then, but of course, right? Like if you, like, let's say osmosis or something, it probably makes a lot of, it definitely will make a lot of sense to think like, okay, what are the types of things that a validator could do, right? That would be bad for the user. And, and then prevent those, right? That obviously makes sense. Yeah, I think that, so, I mean, two things. One, I think, I, so about the Uniswap V3 liquidity, like sandwiching, I think this is gonna have like second bat, negative second order effects so that like, you know, like I said, you know, you're, you're devolving back into an order book. And I think the AMMs worked because they have these like really cool second order effects where it became very easy. So, okay, when you have this like liquidity sniping start to become more prevalent, no one's going to be a passive LP anymore because you're basically going to get screwed. You're only going to take the IL and basically get none of the fees. So what's going to happen is people are going to stop being passive LPs. You devolve into an order book. And part of the beauty of AMMs was like, you're like, hey, if you have a new token, uh, it, it, it decreased the barrier to like entry for new projects, right? Where... You know, currently without an AMM, you have to go hire basically professional market makers to go like market make your token and like do all this stuff. But like without that, w w with AMMs, you can just have your community be the market makers for the thing. And this decreases the barrier to entry to launch new projects. And like that's how we got this proliferation of like new tail end assets of which some of them go on to become these multi-billion dollar things, right? But like, if you get rid of that and like basically make it so no one can be passive LPs anymore, you're gonna basically just increase the barrier to entry and that's gonna have like harmful effect on the ecosystem as a whole. But don't you think there, there are ways to actually design market mechanisms that also work for basically for A, for um, 
for a uh, discrete time uh, as you have on blockchains and b um for for a long for a large number of long tail tokens so basically my 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 position would be that of course Phil Dayen says what he says because I mean I mean I mean of course he would say it's a morally upstanding um, thing to extract MEV to kind of keep the system uh, secure. I also find that um, I mean to me it's 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 not just questionable. It's uh, it, it's outright morally wrong, and whoever can't see that is is I don't know what they're looking at. Um, But yeah, I think there's lots of ways to actually design apps to um, eliminate um, MEV to a large extent. I th and I think privacy is going to do the rest. So I think uh, that's that's going to be the solution. I, I think I think I think the burden falls on a combination of the app and the protocols, right? Because I think the blockchains can can actually do a lot of the heavy lifting here, right? Where I think you can do. Um, you know, threshold encryption, uh, you know, order randomization. We have this thing called joint proposals where instead of having one person propose a block, you have multiple actors be allowed to contribute transactions to a block. And like you, you, you combine a lot of these techniques together at the protocol layer, you can get rid of like 90% of the harmful MEV. And then, you know, I think you tack on additional application layer things like batching and like things like this. I think, you know, you, 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 can, you can solve this quite a bit. So I want to hear uh, Brian's take on Urbit because uh, you, you've been talking about it all, uh, recently and again today. And this is a project that I've not followed uh, very much since we last had them on, but uh, that you seem to be pretty bullish on. So what's going on with Urbit? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, so I guess I've known the Urbit uh, or Galen and like some of the Urbit team since like three and a half years. I also bought some 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 uh, intergalactic real estate back then uh and and i always was like e enormously like drawn to the the vision of orbit of basically having i mean what's the vision of orbit the the one explanation that has to me always felt like understandable and and kind of makes sense to me is okay like back in the day you had like your own computer And you went to the store to buy a CD with the software and like you put this software like CD in your computer and your data was in your computer and then you ran the software on your data and like that's that's kind of how computing worked, right? And then you had the cloud and then the program was in the cloud and your data was in the cloud. And, and sort of my understanding of Urbit is basically, okay, let's create something like a basic computing framework again that kind of works like back in the day where I have my own kind of virtual computer and my software runs in my computer and my data is in my computer and I can uh, and and then you can yeah distribute uh, software and you can communicate with other peers and so I was always very drawn to this now of course Urban has gone like ultimate hardcore in terms of we don't use any existing technology and we do everything from scratch, right? And, and it, the project's 20 years old at this point, right? This is, uh, so the first 12 years, the guy, this is just one guy who did it on his own and then I think Galen, and so it's a very old project, right? A, a huge amount of work went into this. But now, uh, I think early this year, you know, there was like now UI on Urbit, like a uh, landscape and I've, I've been, Yeah, like using it a little bit, and uh, and it's nice. You know, you can you can you can see actually. I think you can see the potential already. There's some people who built a Bitcoin wallet in orbit, right? So you can have like, uh, you know, store your Bitcoin in orbit and make transactions from there, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's cool. We've had we had some people at Course One who are like pretty in, like very interested in orbit too, and so we're. Uh, we've been actually uh, been wanting to like onboard everyone in the company onto Urban, so like maybe we can start using it a little bit. Uh, so I, I, I'm definitely bullish on Urban, and I think it could become a sort of a bunch of different stuff. I don't know. It could definitely be a replacement for 
uh, you know, Discord maybe, right? Like you can have communities on there and chat and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you have a, a, an addressable name, right? So like you, you can easily like message others on Urbit. You could have it as a sort of, um, yeah, you could store keys in there. Um, there's a, a, also one thing, there's something called Urbit Advisor where they basically build some kind of MetaMask-like thing. So it's like a browser extension. And then, you know, you could like go on something and then you could basically like, you know, s sign something from, from within your orbit, right? Like you ask this, it asks this is your orbit planet and like that's, so you could use like, I don't know, sign in with orbit, right? Anywhere. Like, I think that would be, would make a lot of sense, right? Because you also have your, yeah, your, your username uh, that uh, is like human readable uh, and they have great design. Right? I think it always had like, just amazing aesthetic. Uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited. Uh, I had a tweet a little while ago asking people what project do they think has the best aesthetics. And I think like Urbit was like by and far, like the number one like response. Yeah, I totally agree for sure, for sure. Okay, so let me get, let me take a stab at trying to explain Urbit. Cause I think that like, no one understands it. And Cause part of the problem is every time you ask them, they like go on to this like, deep weird tangents about like the vision which is cool but like no one has I, no one explained to me correctly how it works and so this is my understanding can you confirm whether i'm correct or not on this from what i okay do you guys remember secure scuttlebutt we did an episode with them a, a little while ago you know a while ago and it was basically this like social network that used like hash a dag like hash linking structure to build like a network. So basically it will use a gossip network and you know, the like Sebastian will send a message to me. I'll add it to my little hash chain. And then next time I send a message to Brian, I'll also pass along all the messages that Sebastian had sent to me. And basically we get some sort of eventual consistency on the topography of the social network. And like, you know, if people like you and, and it's okay for eventual consistency because like a double sign problem is less of an issue when we're talking about social networks than it is when we're dealing with like payments and money. So here's my theory of what Urbit is. Okay, so Bitcoin invented this cool new data structure called a blockchain. And it was this like very fast consistency, all this stuff, cool things. And they invented it for payments. And then Ethereum came along and said, hey, cool data structure, what if we slap a Turing complete VM on top of this? Now, my theory is what Urbit does is it looks at secure scuttlebutt and says, hey, cool data structure, what if we slap a Turing complete VM on top of this? And so basically what's happening is I have my little VM that's like doing all this computation and it's like, it's hash linking the result of all the computation. But every time your VM sends a message to my VM, let's say it's a, you're send, you know, anything that you would send over the internet, but any message you send to me, I include that into my sort of hash linked tree. And then when I talk to Sebastian, I, I tell him, hey, by the way, Brian's VM sent a message to my VM. That's what I understand Urbit to be. Is that, am I on the mark here? I'm not sure, uh, but like, so here's another, like when we, we had this internal talk and then we had uh, this guy from a team, Irwin, who, who gave a talk. And w one of the ways he explained it, which I also thought was nice, was that if you, if you look at crypto, right? In crypto, we, we have like transactions, right? And you focus, you have all these chains where you have different accounts sending different transactions. And then identity and data are often something that's kind of like layered on top of it or on the side. And then with Urbit, right, you really have, it's like identity and data that's like the, the foundation and there's actually no blockchain, right? And there's no transactions, but then you can put those on top. And, and so it's kind of inverts a little bit, the normal approach we have in, in blockchain. And I think that's, makes sense right and also sort of like what's or maybe another way to think about it is like what's your like your digital home like where is where's your like your base in a way like 
maybe it's like your computer i don't know like the, your hard disk on your computer or is it something like last pass like a, or, or a password manager maybe or like no, no so look, I, I i get i get that my question is i want to understand is how does it work and that's what i'm like you know I don't, I haven't fully understood. Like, okay, they say like, okay, yes, you can transfer your like state of your computer. So, you know, instead of being linked to a physical server, it's just like transferable thing. But my question is like, yes, how? And my assumption what's happening here, once again, is like, you know, let's say I have this entire hash link of all the computation I've done. I sent that over to Sebastian and then I destroy this computer, move to a new computer. When I'm syncing up again, I find out from Sebastian, oh, here's the current state of, or at least Sebastian's knowledge of the current state of my VM. This is all the computation I had done up until then. Yeah, actually, I, so that is something I don't know. Uh, that you have to ask somebody more uh, technically competent about uh, so I'm not sure. Well, I'm trying to boot up a ship right now and it's telling me it's going to take an hour. So, well, <laughs> um, no, I mean, this sounds really interesting. I, 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 I think, I mean, I, I was like secure scuttlebutt was a project that I thought was really cool, like technically. And like, I like this idea of, um, yeah, being able to create a sort of hash chain without a blockchain and like essentially you know, you um, you sort of like sync state at like whenever whenever you want, right? Like you send a message and you can sync that state over, um, you know, even like over over when, like if you're in the same in, in the same place or over like a like a USB stick or something like that. And so, yeah, it, it seems cool that you could also do that sort of like with computation. Yeah. If my understanding of it is correct, that's really cool. I think there is a lot of cool use cases of that. This was super fun and I will look into Abbott now. <laughs>